<laughs> this will be our 36th lesson in Genesis. We're in the midst of a uh, three lesson series on a wife for Isaac. Now, as you know, I'm going through texts like this. We're becoming more acquainted uh, with God. Genesis means beginnings. Every once in a while, I, I list in the back the number of firsts. I didn't this time, but we're over 300 to this point. The things that first first time it ever happened or first mention of something like that. So when we go through these texts, we're going to draw some, we're going to make some note notations about how God worked and so forth because actually the book is not a commentary on Abraham, although he is a subject from chapter 12 on. This is actually a commentary on God. And men like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, or Noah, or Enoch, they were like, gave us a glimpse of God. That's what, that's what actually that was all about. And, well, it's just, it's just marvelous to, uh, to consider. Amen. So we're going to begin... Yeah, the 22nd verse. 22nd verse through the 48th verse. This is a long, uh, long chapter, but we're going to be dealing with these details. Mm -hmm. It came to pass as the camels had done drinking that the man took a golden earring of half a shekel weight and two bracelets for her hand of ten shekels weight of gold and said, Whose daughter art thou? Tell me, I pray thee, is there room in your father's house for us to lodge in? She said unto him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, which she bare to Nahor. She said moreover unto him, We have both straw and provender enough and room for to, look, to lodge in. And the man bowed his head, bowed down his head and worshipped the Lord and said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who hath, not left des who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and truth. Being in the way he led, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. The damsel ran and told them of her mother's house these things. And Rebekah had a brother. His name was Laban. Laban ran out unto the man under the well, and it came to pass when he saw the ear ring and the bracelets upon his sister's hands, and when he heard the words of Rebekah, his sister, saying, Thus spake the man unto me, that he came unto the man, he came unto the man, and behold, he stood by the camels at the well. And he said, Come in, thou blessed of the Lord. Wherefore standest thou without? For I have prepared the house and room for the camels. And the man came into the house, and he ungirded his camels, and gave straw and provender for the camels, and water to wash his feet, and the men's feet were that were with him. And there was set meat before them to eat, but he said, I will not eat until I have told mine errand. And he said, Speak on. He said, I am Abraham's servant. And the Lord hath blessed my master greatly, and he has become great. He hath given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and men servants and maid servants and camels and asses. And Sarah, my master's wife, bare a son to my master when she was old, and unto him hath he given all that he hath. My master made me swear, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife to my son of the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I dwell. But thou shalt go into my father's house and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son. And I said unto my master, Peradventure the woman will not follow me. He said unto me, The Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with thee and prosper thy way, and thou shalt take a wife for my son of my kindred and of my father's house. 
Then shalt thou be clear from this my oath, when thou comest to my kindred, and if they give or not give not, Thee her, if they give not thee one, thou shalt be clear from thy oath. And I came this day unto the well, and I and said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, if thou, if now thou do prosper my way, which I go, behold, I stand by the well of water. It shall come to pass that when a virgin cometh forth to draw water, and I say to her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water of my of thy pitcher to drink. And and she said to me. Both drink thou, and I will draw for thy camels. Let the same be the woman whom the Lord hath appointed out for my master's son. And before I had done before I had done speaking in my heart, I say, before I had done speaking in my heart, behold Rebekah came forth with her pitcher on her shoulder, and she went down into the well and drew water, and I said unto her, let me drink, I pray thee. And she made haste and set on her pitcher from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will give thy, give thy camels drink also. So I drank, and she made the camels drink also. And I asked her and said, Whose daughter art thou? She said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah did bear to him. And I put the earring on her face and braces upon her hands. And I bowed down my head and worshipped the Lord and blessed the Lord God of my master Abraham, which had led me in the right way to take my master's brother's daughter unto his son. Amen. Now that's how a man is led by God talks. That's how they think. It's good to know that. And we're seeing here that the uh, all the way through here, you he talks about God working. Now I'll tell you, I'm, I'm very concerned about this, brethren, that we live in a day when there's not a lot of talk about God working. And some people talk about Him working, I think they're not telling the truth. But there's a lot in Scripture about God working. I just named, I listed some few things here that have been demonstrated already. He like delivers men. Yeah. So when you read about this, this isn't like this is like isn't just an account mm -hmm. of God delivering people. This is telling you God delivers men. And he leads. Said he led me. God leads men. So if you're not sure how you ought to be living or how you ought to go, and some you got do have to subject yourself to scripture. I understand that, but God leads. Leads people. And he teaches people. Scripture tells that God teaches people, brings their spiritual intelligence up, and he guides in judgment and teaches, as was a promise the prophet said, the meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek shall he teach his way. So God teaches people to make right choices, how to walk in, and he speaks of his doings toward men. See, now he works before angels, but it's his doings toward men and he's working salvation in the earth the scripture says and psalmist talked about the wonderful works of God see, you, you got to be able to see you see them and detect them God lifts up the Lord lifts up the meek <laughs> so if you're down in the dumps <laughs> and we can tell you this we, God lifts up Amen. He does his will among earthly inhabitants so the earth may look like it's completely out of control and God does what he wants to do in the earth. It doesn't make any difference what the circumstances are. And he delivers and he rescues and he works with men. These are just a few of the things. He takes away reproach. Jesus said his father works and he said I work. We're workers. So if you're looking for a religion where God isn't doing anything, it's, it's wrong to come to Christ because that's, that's a working religion. Yeah. And he works all in all. So there, <laughs> mm -hmm. even the deceived and the deceiver are his, the scripture says. Yeah, yeah I won't go through the rest. You, you are familiar with these, but it's just good to, to see this. See, that we're reading, we're reading of these works. It's called history and it's a record and so but it's a record of God working. That's what it is. And God has worked with Abraham thus far. He's worked with him. 
Like he called him. Scripture says he brought him out of Ur of the Chaldees. He led him out of Haran. He delivered him from the will of Pharaoh. He prospered him. He delivered him from the will of Abimelech. He caused him to triumph over his enemies. God promised he would be Abraham's shield and exceeding great reward. He enabled him to beget Isaac. He blessed Ishmael because of him. God orchestrated the events pertaining to the offering of Isaac. See, God is in all. Amen. You can mark this down in your uh, intellectual book that if you've made progress in the Lord, you've seen more and you understand more and you're more devoted, God's been doing a work. Amen. That's, right. That's why it's that way. So he's a, this incident here of this servant of Abraham's, this is a living incident of blending faith with the working of God. They, they come together. Now I'm, I'm saying these things because in contemporary Christianity you will not come to these kind of conclusions. I'm telling you the truth. You will not arrive at these kind of conclusions mm -hmm. because there's a different kind of an agenda that's being that's right. yeah. fulfilled. Yeah, Brother Gibbon, you can see that in Genesis, I'm working with Abraham and God's laying down a foundation yeah. that everyone that's in Christ can identify yes. to some degree with every one of these things. That's right. And Amen. if you can, it should be an alarm for you. Amen. Now well, let's start our, start our text. It came to pass as the camels were done were done drinking. Now it was approximately 700 miles from Haran to Nahor by way of the desert. Now Paul when he traveled he said hey, well, I was in peril of robbers and all this sort of thing. But he made this, the servant made this trip and it, without any, anything happening. And I wanted to say a word about divine protection because he was on a mission mm -hmm. for the Lord through Abraham. <coughs> and how the God's noted for this. Now we live here in a section of town where they tell us there's more robberies in this section of town than any other part of town. But we do bank on God protect us. Amen. We do. Amen. I mean we don't leave the doors standing open, you understand? We, we don't tempt God. But you remember Israel when they had three feasts a year all the men had to, all the men of twenty up had to go to these feasts. Left the women and the old folk and the children by themselves in the desert. Now, all right, now what? Uh, and there were hostile <laughs> tribes. When they got into Canaan, there was remnants of hostile tribes still there. But here's what it says about it. In Exodus 34. I will cast out the nations before thee and enlarge thy borders. Neither shall any man desire thy land when thou shalt go up to appear before the Lord thy God thrice in a year. How about that? I think you'd be hard pressed to find an American that'd believe that. I do. But this is uh, this is how God revealed himself. Now look at I'm going to call all the men, all the army. There's going to be no army. I'm going to call them all out. But no one will want your land yeah. while they're gone. <laughs> and it, we read about Jacob. Genesis 35, 5. They journeyed and the terror of God was upon the cities which were round about and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. So God just made them, <laughs> don't touch those people. They knew it. Prior to his trial, Satan confessed to God, you've made a hedge about him. Everything he's got. Couldn't touch him. Does God still do that? Is God still God? Yes, amen. This is part of his godhood. 
Solomon wrote, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes his enemies be at peace with him. That's what he said. Well, that's pretty hard to believe. Well, then work on believing it. God, Paul was facing hostility in Corinth, and Jesus appeared to him. He said, I'm with thee, no man will, shall sit on thee to hurt thee. Huh? That's what he said. No man's going to sit on you. No man's going to hurt you. Stay there. I got much people in the city. Confirming that God can and is inclined to grant safety, the Lord made mention of safety under the first covenant. Wherefore, ye shall do my statutes, keep my judgments, and do them, and ye shall dwell in the land safe. And the land shall yield their fruit, ye shall eat your fill, and dwell therein in safety. See? Of course, they, they weren't obedient, so they were invaded. But that's God. See, God has represented himself. When they prepared to go over Jordan, Israel, Moses said this to the people. When, thou, when you go over Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God giveth you to inherit, and when he giveth you rest from all your enemies round about, so that ye dwell in safety. There it is again. Moses said of Benjamin, the beloved of the Lord shall dwell in safety by him. David wrote, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, doth make me dwell in safety. Solomon said, safety is of the Lord. Back when I was uh, working, 1970, they started worship in the earth, you know. We had ecology and Earth Day and all that kind of stuff. And during that same time, there was a big press for safety. And uh, so they put me in charge of that, and I had a couple big signs that had this scripture on it. Safety is of the Lord. <laughs> they wouldn't... <laughs> They wouldn't. They took them down because <laughs> they said that interferes with our program. Was what? This could be a way of implementing your program. You know. Hosea said, "In that day will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field. The beasts won't. Even the beasts won't attack them. And with the fowls of heaven, huh? And with the creeping things, the snakes." Off the ground, I'll, I'll break the bow and I'll sword and end the battle out of the land and we'll make them lie down safely. So that's, that's how, you know, the snakes didn't come in, the lions didn't come in, the bow and the sword, no one was wanted to fight. That's God. He, so he that happened to this man. That's how that man traveled at least 22 days. The camel's rate was about 35 miles a day, 700 miles. That's... 22 days without incident. Now our text says that when the camels were done drinking. Yes? I was thinking about the safety. And sometimes um, the Lord gives the promise, but sometimes his people can't see the working out of that protection until they enter the peril by faith. Mm -hmm. um, I was considering uh, Pilgrim when he came to this narrow yeah. way that yeah. he knew mm -hmm. he could hear lions on both sides, but it was dark. Yeah. He had the word for safety when the man said, come to me in the middle of the path. Just stay yeah. in the middle. He didn't realize the protection that was there until he actually started walking. Yeah. Then he realized that they were on chains. They were on chains, yeah. Amen. Uh -huh. yeah. Amen. Amen. Now we've already pointed out that there, there were ten camels. Camel stores 52 gallons of water per hump. And they drink from 20 gallons minimum to 50 gallons. These camels have been walking for a long way. This is a woman with a two and a half gallon pitcher. She says, I'll drink, I'll draw water for the camels. So it'd be a minimum of 200 gallons and a maximum of 50, of 50 gallons of water. The well, when you walk down into the well, remember? So that'd be like, 200, they'd be like 80 trips. <laughs> Just to let you know that sometimes when you serve the Lord, you, you, he calls you to do a lot of stuff. Yeah. But she kept on drawing this water. There was a trough. It tells there was a trough. They kept on drawing this water till the camels 
were done drinking. Now, there's a spiritual type here that I thought it would be appropriate to mention. These camels were a picture of spiritual satisfaction. Now there are some people to the own master the standard fall they have never mastered the art of drinking till they're full. I dedicate this to the whoever pioneered the short services. They just never are satiated. They never are filled. They just get enough to knock off the appetite. They go on their way. And they'll now they'll not grow. Mm -hmm. They will not grow. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, any fruit that might come from that won't be a mature fruit. I mean, if they were to produce any fruit from this drinking that they got, it's not it's not going to be like yeah. luscious fruit. It's just going to be small and, and uh, not complete. That's right. If the variety. Yeah. yeah. Berry. Now, to me, it. it it is an imperative that believers learn to drink till they're satisfied. Other things be hanged. Sometimes, you know, you'll sense it. If you're if you are a student and a liver by faith, there's times when you you just you sense that just is coming out. A lot you're getting a lot. Don't cut that short. Just excuse yourself if somebody interrupts. Just excuse yourself. See, not, that's just not the right time. Drink till you're full. Because God's prepared this kind of feast. God doesn't set out hors d'oeuvres yeah, okay. and appetizers. Amen. That's not the kind of table he spreads. Here's how the prophet Isaiah put it. Speaking of salvation, a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the and on the lees, a fat things full of marrow, wines on the lees, well refined. Feast. Here again, ho. Everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. He that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Now, if you're able to do this, you've made some progress. You've already outstripped the average church. The average churchman has no idea what this means. But a lot depends on this. I can tell you that if you were sitting there when Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount and you just went home after half of it, you would have got none of it. That's the way now. This is the way the kingdom of God works. If the Lord sets the table and a person just takes a little dab of this and a dab of that. That's an insult to the Lord. It's an insult to the Lord. To those who learn to live on meager portions, <laughs> they'll not survive because salvation doesn't serve meager portions. If a person eats meager portions, they've got to pick out some of their favorite spiritual foods, so to speak. See? Well, after the camels got through drinking, and our previous text told us that the servant was looking on, he was watching all this. The man took a golden earring, half a shekel of weight, and two braces for her hands, and ten shekels. Gave her these uh, golden gifts. Now the various versions present this inconsistently, but that's uh, you should if you make comparisons, you should kind of be used to that happening. Mm -hmm. uh, the King James version says a golden earring. New King James version says a golden nose ring. New American Standard just says a gold ring. New American Bible says, a gold ring which he fastened on her nose. These are Bibles. I'm, it said that that gold ring earring was a, a half a shekel. 
good new, the good God's Word Bible says it was a fifth of an ounce. The Living Bible says it was a quarter of an ounce. <laughs> Standard version says he put gave her two bracelets for her for her uh, hands. New King James says he gave her two bracelets for her wrist. Good New God's Word Bible just says two bracelets. The New Revised Standard says two bracelets for her arms. The Basic Bible English says two ornaments for her arms. New American Bible says two gold bracelets weighing ten shekels, which she put on her wrist. Ten shekels, that's what the standard version says. God's Word Bible says four ounces. Living Bible says five ounces. Now he that's faithful, unfaithful in that which is least. <laughs> you can't trust him with other things then. Now I, I just proceed that this, I take it just like it said there. That the golden earring was a half a shekel. It mounted to about one, one fifth, one fourth of an ounce. It's in there because they they had a different they weight in grams, so it was a different uh, weight. Now today's uh, value of gold, that one earring would have been about thousand six hundred twenty-two dollars. I said that'd been worth. It's a little gift. This was nothing compared to what he's going to offer, but this little gift. Two bracelets, they'd, they'd be somewhere between twelve and fifteen thousand dollars worth by our currency. So you have an initial gift, an earring, two bracelets, an initial gift at right around in roughly fifteen thousand dollars. Had to get your attention, see. Now there's a type seen here. And when God brings, comes bringing salvation, he gives token gifts that of themselves are very, very valuable, but they're nothing to compare with what, yeah, what he promises. Hope. Like Peter on the day of Pentecost, he, he told the people, he offered them some gifts, see. He said, if you repent and be baptized for the mission of sins, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he said, the promise is to you. Yeah. And you've been seeing the promise live right out, right up here. What you've been seeing is the promise being fulfilled. That same promise that Joel made to you too. Mm -hmm. It was the manner of Jesus. He'd give him a little token. Like Nicodemus came to him by night, he gave him a little some teaching tokens. He told him some things. That, <laughs> very wonderful. See, brother, we do have something to offer. You don't, you don't have to offer people food and toys and games and stuff like that. There's, God has something to offer people initially when they first come to Him. Amen. Well, after he, after he gave, and later on he tells you that he put the brace, he put them on the lady. lady later he's going to tell us. So right away he says, uh, who, who's, whose daughter art thou? Why he's a member, he's driven, he's driven by what Abraham told him to do. Abraham told him, said, You go to my father's house and my kindred, and you get a wife from them. So he's got to find out is this is this woman she she looks so far pretty good. She's she gave me a drink and she's drawn for the camels. Looks like she could be the one. Well, I gotta find out now if she's really kindred. Whose daughter are you? Here's what Abraham said, go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife from Isaac. Beware that thou bring not my son hither. Don't you take Isaac back there. And if the woman will not be willing to follow you, then you'll be free from your oath. Come on back home. <laughs> what, a, what a picture, huh? So a person preaches the gospel, you preach the gospel, you deliver the gospel to the person, you, you lay it out to them, they don't want it. Go back home. Amen. Yeah, that's how I like to work on it. God's told you something by the unwillingness of people has told you something. There's a message that's being delivered to you and people bow their neck and don't want the truth of the gospel. That's a message being delivered to you. Yes. 
if the serpent, if the servant here was Eliezer, which some people think it was, he'd have been pretty old if it was, but if it was, Abraham, Eliezer had been with Abraham for quite a while, over 60 years. And so if he heard a name of his kindred, he, he, could, he could recognize and see right away. Because yeah. he knew about Abraham's uh, family. Now there was a sense in which the servant he had to overcome Rebecca's attractiveness because she was a very beautiful woman, it says. She was very, he had to over, overcome that. Could, could be overly impressed by her beauty and by her willingness to work and everything. She, we have to find out now. She's part of the kindred. She's part of the house. And so he, he asked this. See, good, uh, good preaching and teaching will assist in sharpening our focus. I, now, why I'm saying this, I want to show the power of focus in here. He could have fastened his eyes on Rebecca, or he could fasten his thoughts on what the man, what Abraham had told him to do. And he chose to focus on what Abraham had told him to do. The power of spiritual focus. He must concentrate on the bottom line. A wife for Isaac from among Abraham's kindred. Now, I thought it needful to make a comment about the lethal nature of distraction. This is an area you can't make laws in. I understand that. But every person has to work this out. If Satan can turn your attention so that you don't think about, I'm going to die, mm -hmm. I'm going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ, I'm going to give an account for, my, if, for what I've done. If he can get you to forget that and place that in the background, then he's distracted you. Yeah. Amen. Okay. And you will not be able to make right mm -hmm. decisions, to say the least. That's why the Lord said, don't love the world. Love not the world. Amen. Neither the things that are in the world. Amen. Don't culture an appetite for them. Amen. Don't do it. Why? They're distracting. Yeah. And they'll pull you down there like quicksand. Yeah. Uh -huh. Once you get into these things, they pull you right down into it, see? And some naive souls see that happen. Sol Solomon told his son about the whorish woman. He said, she'll, she'll try and drag you into her house. She'll say, come in, turn in, we'll have a good time. He said, you listen, there's another woman calling out to you. Wisdom is calling out too like that. Yeah, okay. So you guys, two voices you're hearing all the time in your spirit. It's the Lord saying, come, come and learn from me. It's another voice. He said, now come over here. I'll give you some more immediate mm -hmm. benefits. You see, in this servant refused to, refused to be turned aside. Even he could have dropped everything there and said, well, so look at that. She, I asked her, I asked God to have her give me a drink if I ask her. And then volunteered to water the camels. And she did that, so that pretty much that pretty much proves it right there. No, no. He had to have okay. he had to find out whether she was of the kindred or not. Amen. Then he asked the question to make sure that uh, He'd be received. He's asked if there was room. You got room for us? <laughs> now we talked about it. I, I did a little research on this. Like how many people have to attend a caravan of 10 camels? It, that I found out it's like a standard, kind of a standard caravan. They still got them today in the desert exactly like they did two or 3,000 years ago. They still do it. Said so at least one person per camel, depending on how heavy they were laden. So you could have from 10 to 20 servants. So this here could be this master here. From 10 to 20 servants, he turns up on the spur of the moment, and he asks if he can spend the night. Yeah. Now, now you got to, you know, you say, I wonder what I do. Bink, bink. Got 20 people here, 21 people. Got room for us not only to stay, feed them, and take care of them too. And we got 10 pickup trucks out here that have to be unloaded. And I wonder if we could, uh, yeah, see, but they did, they were ready. Yeah, uh -huh. They were ready to do it, ready to lodge them. But he just for a night. 
He's not intending like to move in. He's only there to pick up, pick up the woman that God has appointed and to take her back to Isaac. That's his only reason for being there. Now, that's another uh, type here, you see. The saints do not intend to spend a lengthy time in this place, Amen. the world. We're, we're thinking about what Solomon referred to as our long home. Yeah. That's Ecclesiastes 12.5, our long home. So we're actually, we're just uh, journeying through here. We want to just know if we can just spend the night, that's, that's all. Yeah. Now there's a song I, I remember when I was writing this that we used to sing in Indiana. It's a favorite song of one of our brethren there, Charles Eaton. I'm a pilgrim. I'm going to try and sing the first verse if I can. I'm a pilgrim and I'm a stranger. I can tarry, I can tarry but a night. Do not detain me for I am going to where the fountains are ever flowing. I'm a pilgrim and I'm a stranger. I can tarry, I can tarry but a night. Now Christian people used to sing a lot of songs like that. You will hardly ever hear a song like that. You will never hear a praise chorus like that unless they're quoting some Bible verse. And this is a, this is a frame of mind that has been lost in the modern church generation. And old hymnals, they were packed with songs about this. Hymnals like the 18th, 17th, 1800s. So I, I, I thought about that at any rate <laughs> as I was going through this. Now he asked her, are you, uh, whose daughter are you? He didn't say, are you, are you related to Abraham? You got to know how to ask questions. Yeah, see. Yeah. He, he said, whose daughter are you? Then, then I'll know whether you're related or not. She said, well, I'm the daughter of Bethuel, the son of, Mil the son of Milcah, which she bare to Nahor. See, that's what he knew. Nahor, that was Abraham's brother. Nahor was his brother. So it, she, she fits the bill. She's, she's qualified. You remember upon um, Abraham's return after he found the ram in the thicket and he offered him up in the stead of, stead of Isaac? At the end of that chapter it says he got a report about some of the relatives. Remember that? <laughs> And here was the report he got. Behold, Milka, she mentioned she's, she's the daughter of Milka. Behold, Milka, she hath also borne children unto thy brother, Nahor. Huz, his firstborn, and Buzz, his brother. Those names are open if you didn't want to use them. And Kemuel, the father of Aram, and Chesed, and Hazo, and Pildash, and Zidlaf, and Bethuel. And Bethuel begat Rebekah. So, that, so you're introduced, God had already kind of mapping out the, mapping this out. Now here's an interesting thing. You go through that little report there, who was born. Huz, <coughs> he was a man, male. Buzz, male. Kemuel was a male. Chesed was a male. Hazo, son. Bill Pildash, son. Jidlaf, son. Bethuel, son. Rebecca, daughter. Teba, son, Gaham, son, Thahash, son, Maica, son. She was the woman. Yeah, amen. Now, I don't know if that means they didn't have any daughters, but that means, so far as God's plan was concerned, it was just one. Yeah, amen. Now, commencing with the 12th chapter of Genesis, daughters are mentioned. Lot had two daughters, they're unnamed. Sarah said to be the daughter of Abraham's father, Terah. They were the daughters of the Canaanites and the daughters of men, and Rebekah was the daughter of Bethuel. See how few, a few times this is mentioned? 
This is because now God's going to begin to work this plan of redemption out. And so now we're, we're going to bring this matter up with daughters. Eve was never called, well, Eve wasn't a daughter. And it says Adam begat sons and daughters, but we don't, yeah. <laughs> no names are provided at all. So this suggests a divine focus all along was on Rebecca. It's just that the servant had to find out who it was. Yeah. She was, Michael introduced this thought to us last time. Genesis 24, 8 says, if the woman, yeah. Abraham said, if the woman, not a woman, if the woman be willing to follow thee, will, will not be willing to follow thee. So I'm, I'm persuaded that this was the person God had chosen Amen. all along. And she said, we have, uh, we have straw and provender. Provender would be food for the various parts of food for the camels. Now you notice she's informed about what's going on at home. Yeah, yeah a lot of people... Family members living at home, they don't know what's going on. They got to live in their own little world. But see, she knew yeah. what was happening there. We have room. We got enough for the camels, too. Ten camels. As I understand, that'd be up to about 90 pounds of food per day. Must have had a pretty good cupboard. See, hospitality involves something. And you're, you're reading here that Abraham was hospitable, Lot was hospitable, now you find in Laban, they're hospitable too. And Rebecca reports there's plenty, plenty here. Now I'm worried about hospitality because this is uh, not common. When we used to have the uh, renewals at different places before it was so hard to find a church that host it. The biggest single problem we had was with hospitality. Monumental. Monumental. We're talking about Christian people. Monumental. But the scripture says be, do not be forgetful to entertain strangers. Strangers means someone not ordinarily coming to your house needs a place to stay. For thereby some have entertained angels unaware, hey, both Abraham and Lot. Looked like people, but it were, really were angels. A widow who was supported by the church had to be 60 years old. C couldn't support her. Didn't make a difference how bad off she was. Just needed to get married again. This is, this is what the scripture says. But there was a qualification. Only if she's lodged strangers and wash the saints' feet. If she hasn't been hospitable, no support. Hmm? Say, well, that sounds kind of hard. Sounded like the widow didn't wasn't considered wasn't considered. That, that's found in, in the scripture, and so you can uh, read it for yourself. Now there were hospitable people in the scripture that when Jesus was here. It says of Martha, she received him into her house, and the indications are when he was in that area, he'd, he'd spend time there at their house. Zacchaeus, he received Jesus into his house. Simon the Tanner received Peter into his house. Lydia, remember after she's converted, she asked Paul and all those with him, come in, if you judge me worthy, come in and abide in my house. Philip the Evangelist, he, you know, he entertained Paul and a group of people traveling with him coming to their house, and even the barbarians at Melita, remember when they had that shipwreck? Yeah. They treated them kindly and were hospitable. And Phoebe, she was she was hospitable. Paul says, she's been a sucker of many, and of myself also. Yeah, amen. And Gaius, the elder, he was faithfully whatever he did to brethren and strangers. So hospitality, this is a significant thing in Scripture. All right, now we got some additional information. Not only is she an attractive woman, and she was a virgin, said she was a free woman. She's of the right kindred. So what do we do now? Time to thank the Lord. Yeah, 
The man bowed down his head and worshipped the Lord, and he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and truth. I being in the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. Now this bowing of the head, oh, you probably heard people argue about the posture of prayer and whether you ought to bow your head or whether you ought to raise your head and all this kind of stuff. Always seemed kind of foolish to me, but the bowing of the head or the kneeling down, the bending down, some people fell down, some lay prostrate. It was an admission that God was greater Amen. and they were lesser. That's right. yep. Amen. Now this again, these are not things you mandate to be done. Yeah. But when I could do it, I always like to pray down on the floor. Maybe I should resume that. Maybe I would be able to get up if I did that. See, it shouldn't surprise us in a self-centered age that this is like strange, strange language. And he said, blessed be the Lord. Now we talk some about that. What, is that. what do people mean when they say, blessed be the Lord? What does that mean, blessed be the Lord? How do you bless the Lord? Now, you will not find any satisfaction in any Hebrew lexicon, lexicon, any Greek lexicon, any English dictionary. If you look up the word bless, you'll say, like, does anybody know what this means? Then is to give a benefit to somebody, which is, that is true. But here he blesses God. And the scripture says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Yeah. He's, Be not forgetful of all his benefits. Mm -hmm. Now the revelation states that God is worthy to receive blessing. Every creature which is in the heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them were, were heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him. There it is. In the seventh chapter, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God. So how, <laughs> so how do you bless God? How does God receive any benefit from us? Well, he does. Let me give you some statements of it. It's not that you add something to him. It's that it brings great joy and satisfaction to God when his people are thankful. Now here, let me give you some examples. Isaiah 62, 5. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee, and as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. That's blessing God, see? Here's another. I will rejoice in Jerusalem. God says it. Zephaniah said, He will rejoice over he, thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. He's been blessed, see. <laughs> Remember that when Jesus found a lost sheep, parable of the lost sheep, he said, he comes home and says, Rejoice with me. And Numbers 14, 8 said, If the Lord delight in us, he'll bring us. Deuteronomy 10, 15, only the Lord had to delight in thy fathers to love them. Whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth and chaseth, as even as a father, the son in whom he delights. They have a froward heart and abomination to the Lord, but such as are upright in their way are his delight. Well, I won't read any more, but you see that when you bless God, you are in fact telling God that you've seen and recognized what he's done and you're thanking him for it and this causes great delight. Amen. This blesses God. It's good to think of God this way. Sometimes people think of God more like a big ogre of some kind that frowning all the time. But this uh, pleasing God. Now he called God the God of his master. He didn't say my God. Although God was over the servant too, but he said the God of my master. This man, this servant, knew that without Abraham, he lost his status. 
right. His status depended on Abraham. That's why he said, the God of my my master Abraham. He wasn't saying, he's not my God. He said, I, because of Abraham. Now that's a type of the saints in, in Christ. With the servant, it was, the hierarchy was God, Abraham, servant. Strict order. With us, God, Christ, us. Amen. Very strict. Yeah. He blesses us for Christ's sake. And I make mention many times that the phrase through Christ, in Christ, by Christ, mm -hmm. in Jesus, through Jesus, by Jesus, in the Lord Jesus, by the Lord Jesus. It's a hundred sometimes those expressions are mentioned. So we know that whatever we have, it's because of the Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And he's not left my master, he's thanking God, he's not left my master destitute of mercy and truth. Interesting, those two are joined together, mercy and truth. Psalmist joined them together, he said mercy and truth are meant together, speaking of redemption, mercy and truth. Ordinarily, if without... Uh, Without the salvation of God in mind, you couldn't get mercy and truth mm -hmm. together. Truth would testify against the people, see. Yeah, that's right. Here's the picture you have that before the redemption is in Christ Jesus, the truth condemned the people. Mercy cried out, he needs mercy, he needs mercy, but they couldn't, mm -hmm. they couldn't get together because sin hadn't been taken away. Yeah. But when sin was taken away, and the devil's head was bruised and the world is reconciled to God now mercy and truth they get together and he was a this was a sort of a type of it mercy has to do with God's uh, kindness when it's undeserved and truth Truth is reality that's firm and unshakable. The idea is that God is faithfully acts in strict accord with his person and promises. So he has he made some tremendous promises to Abraham. And the servant is saying, God hasn't balked on any of these any of these promises. But I being in the way, not in the way like an obstacle way. <laughs> I was on the right road. In the way means I was on the right road. I been in the way. He didn't take a road to Ur the Chaldees, you know, or to Babylon. He was on the right road. He guided me. Some versions do read it a little bit different, but I'm gonna, I, I stick with this one that because I was in the way the Lord led me. I was I was a leadable person. I was on the right yeah. I was on the right path. Yes. Now it might su not surprise you, but some people would like God to lead them, but they're walking were walking on the wrong road, yeah. uh -huh. and the Lord doesn't lead them in that particular road. And the Lord led me to the house of my my brethren. He God had told him, he said, the Lord will send his angel. The Lord will send his angel to you. And he'll bring you to the house of my brethren. So he said, that's just what happened. Mm -hmm. I didn't just, I didn't follow the stars, you know. Yeah, that's right. The Lord said this in connection with Israel, too. He told him about leading him. I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way, he told him. Exodus 33 Two, I will send an angel before thee. Exodus 30, 23, 23. Mine angels shall go before thee. Exodus 32, 34. Mine angels shall go before thee. In assessing the deliverance of Israel, Moses said, When we cried unto the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel and brought us forth out of Egypt. <laughs> That's God's man. This is God's man. This is what God does. So if you're where you ought to be in Christ, you've been led there. Amen. 
See, you've been led there. That's why you're there. You say, well, it's because I studied hard. You've been led there. Yeah. Amen. I was in the way. Now, much is made of this in Scripture about being in the in the way. Isaiah called it the way of holiness. Isaiah 35a. Jesus said the way is narrow, is a narrow way. Epistle of Hebrews speaks about a new and a living way has been opened up. See, so if you want God to lead you, you you got to be on that way. Amen. You have to be. Like that phrase, the ancient paths. Ancient yeah. paths. Yeah. He's the one that'll take you out of the pit and set your feet on a rock and establish your goings. That's right. And now your mandate is to fo walk, following, following. That's right. Stay where God puts you. You are put on the road. Mm -hmm. If you're born again, you're put on the road. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now then, after this, uh, apparently Rebecca may have heard him praying this. Mm -hmm. She runs to her mother's house and tells about these things. You notice the element of haste all through this? Mm -hmm. The servant ran to meet Rebecca. She hasted to get him a drink. When she watered the camel, she hasted and emptied her pitcher. Now it's written as she ran. See, the whole thing is <laughs> characterized by haste. A little later, Laban will run to the Run to the well. I'm reminded of something David said one time when he was fleeing Saul. He said, The king's business required haste. Mm -hmm. Now, there's something to be said about a slowness of response to God. This does not set well with God. And we've got to try not to be, we're not trying to be harsh here, but this, people have to know what the Lord's like. Jesus said to his own disciples, Do ye not yet understand? Again, Jesus said, Are ye, to his disciples, Are ye also without understanding? Do ye yet, do not ye yet understand? One time Jesus said, Oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long? To his disciples, they're on the coming down the Mount of Transfiguration. That's when he said this. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Hmm? And again, Mark 8, 17, Perceive ye not yet? I mean, how much? Is Jesus talking. How much do I have to say before it gets through to you? Yeah. So, it's in order to ask God to make you of quick understanding. Pick up on things quick. Be instant to respond. Now that was before Pentecost. The disciples weren't like that after Pentecost. You'll understand. They, were, they weren't slow. They, there's a comment John makes about this. These things understood not his disciples at the first but when Jesus was glorified, oh, they didn't remember they the things that were written of him. See, then, then, then it came to him after Jesus returned to heaven. Now we have a new party enters into the situation. Well, incidentally, you might wonder why did it say she told her mother's house? Why didn't she say she told her father's house? They sound strange, like strange language. But the household does belong to the mother. Solomon said that in the virtuous woman says her household and her husband trusts, trusted her. She can even go out and buy a field, sell her wares, businesswoman, took care of the house. Her children always had food and clothes. She was the head of the house. In fact, guess what uh, 1 Timothy 5.14 says that of the household. She did it with her interest in her husband. I mean, I understand that, but she's the one that was there all the time. Yeah. Uh -huh. So Rebecca, she wisely tells her mother, here's a strange man. She saw a strange man for the first time. He hasn't mentioned anything about looking for a wife yet. 
So you see here, he gave me these, gave me these bracelets and this earring here. And tell that I could imagine, oh, God, be, be careful, Milka, say, man, be careful here. So she did a wise thing. She was an adult woman. Re Rebecca's not a child. She's an adult woman, but she tells this. Always keeping everything open and above, above board. And she told them they're gonna. We got plenty of room. So she had to alert them to that, because they're going to have to like provide water for wa the men to wash. They're going to have to unload the camels. They're going to have to feed the camels. They're going to have to serve a meal to the servant and all those with him and sleeping accommodations. So yeah, I could imagine you'd have to kind of alert. <laughs> Alert the house. Now enters her brother Laban, who's a lot. There's a lot of stuff about Laban in the Bible. Laban, her brother. Rebecca had a brother. His name was Laban. Remember, Jacob dealt with this Laban, who had Leah and Rachel. Remember, so this this he's a prominent person. Now here's how I, Laban is described. Laban, son of Bethuel the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob and Esau's mother. How's that for a description, huh? Isn't that good? Yeah. He's also called Laban the Syrian in Genesis 25, 20. And Laban will prove to be like a key, a key person in this history of developing a Jewish race and preparing for the Messiah. Bethuel, the son of Nahor, is only mentioned nine times in the Genesis record. But Laban's mentioned about 60 times, I believe. He's not mentioned more because he is more impressive because he was more involved in the workings out of the Lord. And that's a pattern throughout Scripture that when a person, when they touch what God is doing, whether they have something to do with one of the people that God's working with or with the nation, then at that point they're mentioned, not before. The only time you read about Herod, the first Herod, is when he sought to kill Jesus. You had ever read about him before that. And the only thing you read about the other Herod is when he had Jesus come to remember to him. And, but, and then in the next Herod after that, the only time you read about him is when he killed James. It's only when the Pharaoh, the only time you read about Pharaoh is when they had dealings with Abraham. This is how God feels about famous people. Uh, everybody's an absolute nobody uh -huh. until they come in contact with God's people. And even then they may prove to be a nobody. There were a number of wicked people in the Bible that are mentioned only because they had to do with God's people. Caesar Augustus and Herod and Pilate and Herod and Pilate and other Herod and Caiaphas and Gamaliel, see? The only reason they're mentioned is because of that. You say, well, what, so what relevance does that have to us? You should attach real importance to someone who is who has some kind of role in your life of faith whether it's an inhibitive role or whether it's a profitable one those people are the most important people in your life Amen. the people who are hindering you you got to be on guard vigilant not to let this happen those that are sent by God, you got to pay attention, draw near to them, you can't forfeit their friendship. See, as soon as they, as soon as they're involved in what God's doing, they are importance rockets yeah. to the top. Well, our text says that Laban saw the earring and the bracelets, and he heard the words of Rebekah, his sister, saying, thus the man spake unto me. So he saw this <laughs> Must have made him kind of covetous, as kind of the picture you get. But he saw it, heard it. Now there's a 
precious type in this that you see too of what takes place in Christ Jesus when the saved bear witness of what happened to them like Rebecca she, he said unto me remember, she, when the saved bear witness to what happened to them or give a reason for the hope that's in them the hearer ought to be able to behold something on their wrists and yeah. something on their, no, on their ear <laughs> they should be able to see some kind of a gift that God's given them. Yeah, amen. So you had the word of Rebecca and the gifts testified of the truth of what she said. A lot of evangelism and missions are greatly hindered by a lack of confirming evidence. That's right. Just isn't there. So until the gospel is preached either hostile influences or favorable influences can't be predicted. You can't predict this. Who's going to reject? Who's going to accept? The only way has to, the gospel has to be delivered. Amen. So Laban runs out. We remember Brother John when he prayed for people. He would buttress it with a testimony. He would say, I know God can do this because he healed me. Yeah. And so, but see, that, that kind of confidence right. can't be manufactured by the flesh. No. It just can't. It's like an earring. That's right. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So he ran out there and, uh, and uh, well, the servant had held his ground. There he was. Said, he stood by the well, by the camels at the well. He was where he ought to be, by the camels. Yeah at the well. Now I imagine there were a lot of people there. Remember it said when he came there, it said this is where the women came out at a certain time to get water. He was a passerby. There must have been others. So it wasn't like, oh, there he is. You, know, you had to, he probably had to hunt around to find him. That's where he found him. What if, what if the servant had decided to go away from the well and stand off at the side, make a little, little more room for somebody else? He might not have found him. So he stayed by the well with the camels. Now again, there's something to be learned from this. What we say about the Lord ought to be able to be confirmed on an immediate basis. So there ought to be something that can be confirmed immediately. Yeah. Maybe it's your holy life, what it is, your own thinking on the matter, but it has, there should be something that immediately says the person at least is serious in what he's saying here. Some kind of uh, evidence. I don't want to spend a lot of time here, but in my own judgment, there is an enormous amount of ambiguity associated with modern day evangelism and missions. There's, there's just too much ambiguity. Distraction to its food and supplies and entertainment and all sorts of things that aren't really immediately connected with the business at hand. And I think that really uh, people need to do a lot of thinking about this. So as a result, there's very little is known about Christ or why he had to die. They'll say, Jesus loved you and died for you, but see, I, 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 it's sensitive, so it's like a why. Uh -huh, yeah. Why did he have to die? Well, I just had, you know, no, no answers. But there should be some evidence presented. And Laban, he doesn't hesitate. He welcomes. He says, what do you, come in. He says, well, why are you standing out here? I mean, you, Rachel told you, you know, that we had plenty of room. What are you waiting out here for? Well, he's wait. He wasn't going to impose himself. He was going to wait because this is going to be part of if they be willing to give her to you. See, so this had to be a willing house. So he he postured himself so this could see if this was the case. And he says, thou blessed of the Lord. <laughs> well, just looking at it, the servant, he could see the number of camels he had, the number of servants he had, the nature of the loads on the camels, and the expensive gifts that he gave, and that kind of, Lord's blessed this man here. Blessed him. He didn't conclude that, the, well, you must have worked really hard. Servant, you must, well, I can see you're very industrious. You must have worked real hard to accumulate all this. Now I said, you're blessed to the Lord. That's what it is. Even though Nahor didn't go to Canaan, 
with uh, Abraham, he apparently did leave Ur of the Chaldees. Apparently did. And he was up there, we understand, somewhere near Haran. It's hard, no one really knows for sure where, where Nahor is, but it was up somewhere up there, which would be the north western part of Mesopotamia. And Ur of the Chaldees was in the south eastern part of Mesopotamia. So I say this because when they say Abraham, see this all <laughs> perk up as Bethuel's grandfather, so he's going to know. And years later, uh, well, Jacob will have dealings with, with Laban, and Laban will say to him, the God of Abraham and the God of Nahor. So Nahor must have, uh, Abraham must have testified some way to him. The God of Nahor. It wasn't another God either. But he didn't mention the God of Isaac, but so Jacob at the time said to him, Jacob swear by the fear of his father Isaac, capital F was his word for God. So this was a part of the family. Nahor had to recognize that even though Abram was his brother, he had been blessed in a different way, superior way to Nahor. See? This didn't mean that Nahor wasn't valuable because he had to he get he had to, uh, Isaac had to get his wife from his from his family. But there are some people you finally have to just step back and say they're more important than me. I mean this we don't all have the same value. I'm sure we know this, but it's just good to, no matter how great you are, there's somebody that's greater than you. So far as the covenant of God was concerned, it wasn't with Nahor, it was with Abraham. And the covenant wasn't with Rebecca. It'd be with her son, Isaac. Why are you standing without? Well, I think sometimes that I think sometimes the Lord whispers that to the souls of some people. How come you're standing outside? When I told you that in my father's house there are many mansions, what, 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 what are you doing standing aloof like that? Something to learn. Then the man, he, he then went into the house. And they right away set a meal before him. They set meat before him. Meat, meat in the Bible means meal. Doesn't mean flesh. Means a meal. And it's compared with milk. It's like comparing a bottle with a meal. The, the milk, the milk is just the bald word itself. Meat is what the implications of the Word of God, what it leads to. The understanding what it's talking about, that's the meat. Mm -hmm. that's, right. that's the meal. Uh -huh. Now see, there are some people that never sit down, they go to church, but they never sit down to a meal. Yeah. They don't. Mm -hmm. At the best, it's, it's a bottle. They set a meal out before him. And pilgrims need meals. Amen. They need sustenance. And not only uh, set a meal out before him, he un unloaded the camels. It's, it's Laban that did this. He unloaded the camels, fed the camels, straw and provender. Then he, he brought some water in so they could wash their feet, refresh themselves. He didn't wash their feet. Now this was a, this was a custom, and Abraham met these three. Remember these three that appeared to him. He said, "Let me let let a little water be brought and wash your feet." He so they they did the washing, but they brought the feet. When remember when Jesus that woman poured her ointment on Jesus' feet, and she was criticized, and Jesus said to Simon, "He said if he said." I entered into thy house, and thou gavest me no water to wash my feet, see? So this would mean that Laban washed their feet, and it wasn't the practice. Jesus washed their feet, but that was unusual. Yeah, that's right. 
-huh. Normally they'd give the water and you wash your own feet, but that was what was so unusual about that Jesus washed their feet, see. So that was quite a service that he gave them. Got ready to eat. And the servant says, I'm not going to eat till I've told you my errand for why I'm here. First things first. You see, you see this, I'm sure. First things first, I will not eat until I tell my errand first. So the, uh, they said, well, speak on. What does that mean, speak on? Start talking and don't stop till you're done. Then they give us a brief summation. Speak on. Tell us why you're here. Now there are messages that are intended to be delivered in their totality. There's messages like that. Just be delivered in totality. Peter's declaration at Pentecost, it was like that. He started out a certain place, they had to deliver it. If you if you were left in the middle of that what he preached, you'd have missed out. Yeah, that's right. He had to be delivered in totality. Peter's message in the temple in Acts three, it, it had to be delivered in totality. Stephen's defense before the Sanhedrin, see, it was the whole thing had to be told. Peter, Paul at church at Antioch, whole all the epistles, they're all examples of this. They deliver a, a total message. No epistle is like introductory. There's a, there's a full message that's delivered there. I'll not speak till I told you my errand. That's the way with Jesus. Sometimes people get in the hot water. They're not Christians. They get in the hot water and they want Jesus to pull them out. Now, I'm not, I would never say God, he wouldn't do this. But I think he will say, I'm going to first tell you what my mission is. It's to bring sons to glory. Amen. To save them and bring them to glory. i got to tell my mission first. Then he rehearsed. Item for item, line for line, he rehearsed the whole events up to this up to this time, he said, first of all, I'm Abraham's servant, just so you know. He didn't say, I represent Abraham, that I'm Abraham's servant. I wanted to distinguish between a servant and a bond servant, because there is a difference. A bond servant was purchased and didn't have anything to do with the business of the master. He didn't, they didn't tell him what he was doing, he just was a slave, that's what he was. Jesus distinguished between these kind of people that serve and then those that are of a higher order. Like the like this servant here, he was a higher order servant. So. Jesus said, uh, henceforth I call you not servants. For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. Well, that's this lower level. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my father I have made known to you. All right. This servant of Abraham was that kind of servant. Abraham told him what was going on and what, how God had led him there and what God told him to do. See, he divulged to him the whole of the story. And now he, he makes clear that they don't think this is his mission, that they know this is Abraham's Mission. I said, the Lord's blessed my master. And he's got flocks. That'd be sheep or goats. Herds. would be cattle. Silver. Gold. Men servants. Maid servants. Camels. Asses. He didn't say, my, my master Abraham is very wise. He invested his money wisely. And he worked hard and he built this ranch. He'd been blessed by God. Yeah. Now I'll tell you, not many of us have a, like, by a USA standards a lot. Now if you go to other countries, you do have a lot. But if you ever confront someone that thinks you have, that you are very wealthy because they're from another country, you be sure to tell them, my master. 
gave me this. Sure you make that plain to them? Because that's really the way it is. See, blessing is attested by possessions. Now they were, Abraham, what God promised Abraham was not of a heavenly or spiritual nature. It was all a spring, a lot of offspring in a land. That was what he said. It was of a different order. But it was a, when he saw that he had these things that God promised, then you know God blessed him. Well, there's things God has promised to those that in Christ Jesus. They ought to be present. Things like peace, contentment, fruit of the Spirit, old things passing away, all things becoming new, a purged conscience, confidence before God, full assurance of faith, and so forth and so forth. If you've been blessed, you got these things. And you can say this, God has blessed me. You can, you can give a testimony, God has blessed me. And then testify to the existence of these things. And beside that, he said, um, Sarah, his wife, Nahor knew about Sarah because she was married. Abram and Sarah married before they, before they left Ur of the Chaldees and before Haran died and while Nahor was still at home and they knew she was barren because right at the first. Genesis 11 said she was barren. They married. Sarah, my master's wife, bare him a son, bare a son to, to my master when she was old. And here come the kicker. <laughs> all this wealth I told you about, all this wealth I told you about that my master has, he's given all that. All that he hath to that son Sarah had. All right, now that, that put a different kind of a slant on this visit, didn't it? Whoever married Isaac, they'd come into all that, see? Well, you certainly ought to see the parallel there that Jesus is God's son and God's given him everything, put it all into his hands, everything, and you get it all if you marry him. A chaste virgin. And this master of mine, he made me swear. Promise by making an oath. He made me swear that he... I find him, Isaac, a wife among his kindred. That's why I'm here. I wouldn't be here if my master hadn't sent me on this mission. I wouldn't be here. And then he goes on, he tells him that the Lord sent his angel. They brought him here. My master Abraham told me he was going to do this. So I've, I've been directed by the Lord's angel to this place here. There's a lesson to be learned here. <coughs> we should proceed without eliminating, which in our growth, in our growth, we should proceed without eliminating any of the evidence that's already been presented. You may think it's small, you may think it's insignificant, no, no. The evidences have to build. They're not replaced. You first receive joy, you gotta keep that joy. As you grow, you got to keep that joy. You had the full assurance of faith. You had to keep. You had to keep it. You have to keep it. You have to keep. When God adds to you, you've got to keep what you had before. When the Lord added camels and He added all these things, He kept the ones He had before. But some people, I get the impression they think you like replace things that God gave you, but. You add to it. You add to your faith. You increase. Abraham left her of the Chaldees. He never did forget about that. Then he went to Haran. He didn't forget about that. All these various stages. See, he remembered all this. And now the servant, he's remembering what God's happened to him. What does that do? Well, it teaches you that God's faithful. See, God's faithful. That, that has to be established in people's heart and mind. God is faithful. Yeah. That's why you rehearse uh -huh. where you are and how long you've been there and this sort of thing. Uh -huh. As he, he talked to her, he talked to them, he mentioned that... Uh, he had prayed, Let the same be she that thou hast appointed. 
So I'm looking for someone that was appointed by God. Let the same be the woman whom the Lord hath appointed out for my master's son. So you actually you can't, you can't say it any clearer. Can't modify but well, God doesn't do that. Well, this is what he did. Yeah. God is represented as appointing and choosing. Some people object to this side. They don't they say, well God doesn't do that. Hey, these people don't know what they're talking about. God does do that. Amen. I'm gonna take a moment here to show that you really something's basically wrong. If a person doesn't see this they have a more serious problem than not seeing it, let me tell you. Because God has been over backwards to teach you nobody's involved in his project that he doesn't choose. Amen. That's right. Thus far in Genesis record, those who have been chosen by God, let's take a look at them, mostly in the Messianic lineage. There was Seth, Seth lived 930 years, and after uh, after uh, Adam lived 930 years, and after Seth was born, Adam lived 800 more years, and begat many sons and daughters. But only one was chosen. <laughs> Enos was begotten by Seth. Seth lived 912 years begetting sons and daughters for the last 807 years, but the only son, Enos, out of all those sons and daughters. Canaan begat, was begotten by Enos, who lived 100, 905 years, and he begat sons and daughters for 815 years. Only Canaan was chose. Mahalaleo was begotten by Canaan, who lived 910 years, and begat sons and daughters during the last 840 years. And Jared was begotten by Mahalaleo, who lived 895 years, begetting sons for, and daughters for 830 years. Enoch was begotten by Jared, who lived 962 years, begetting sons and daughters during the last 800 years of his life. Only Enoch was in the lineage. Methuselah was begotten by Enoch, who was on earth 365 years, and begat sons and daughters for the last 300 years. Lamech was begotten by Methuselah, who lived 969 years and begat sons and daughters for 762 years. Noah was begotten by Lamech, who lived 777 years, begotten sons and daughters for the last 595 years. Shem was begotten by Noah, who was born 950 years, and we only have three sons that recorded he had. Our fact said was begotten by Shem, who lived 602 years, and begat sons for the last 500 years, and I won't read the rest. But I will tell you, at this point, only two women have been mentioned. Sarah and Rebecca. And both of them were chosen. And out of all these, who knows, who knows the number of the progeny of these people who begat sons and daughters for centuries? Who has any idea how many they, but only one, only one of the offspring of each one of these persons was chosen to be in the Abrahamic, in the Messianic line, leading up to Abraham. And it was after, there's 75, I believe, there's 75 individuals whose genealogy is traced from Adam to Christ out of all the billions of people that lived. And the only way you can account for it is God chose them. I don't see how anybody could account for it any other way. So his choices are not based on what he foresees men would do because of all these people we just named, of 16 of them, we know absolutely nothing about them. We just know who their father was, who their brain progeny was, but we don't know works that these people did at all. Such people as Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalil, Jared, Methuselah, Lamech, Shem, Arphax, Ad, Selah, Eber, Peleg, Ru, Sarek, Nahor, Tewa. We don't know anything they did. But they were all chosen. 
Amen. So God's choices are not based on what men do. Amen. He recounts that Rachel brought forth her picture, you remember, and I won't go into this in detail as I have in this lesson here, but I give you a little box that you could compare what the incident, what the record was, and what he said. And it, it's, it's a good parallel, all of them. See, this is the manner of God's salvation. He's showing her, he's showing the household that God has worked all this out. And somehow in the message of salvation, that's got to get across, that God has worked all this out. And I'm here telling you about what about this great salvation because it's a salvation that has been worked out by God. And he's led us up to this moment. Great truth to see. Amen. This is the way you find out what God's will is. Is by walking in this path where God's working. That's, what, that's how you learn what God's will is. Amen. Present your body a living sacrifice unto God, holy, acceptable, which is your reasonable service, and you find out what the will of the Lord is. He'll show you his secret. And he again, uh, he just recounts in vivid detail everything that happened. I won't, I won't rehearse it for you, but it teaches us that when we are recounting our experience in Christ Jesus it should line up perfectly with scripture Amen. That's right. if, you, if there's some something that does it but it's, a, it's something unique to you we don't say that God didn't do that but you, you guard yourself how you present it just guard yourself how you present it if you say God showed me <laughs> well, you, yeah. you make sure that is what happened if you're not, just phrase it some other way, but follow this servant. This servant is very precise in how he related this. And uh, he related it so he wouldn't appear to be imposing himself. Like, for instance, he didn't say to them, and Rebecca said, you got plenty of room and for myself and a men and the camels. He, he didn't pass that on. But I can see why he didn't, see? He wasn't imposing himself. He wasn't saying, God sent me and you got no choice in the matter. You got no, he gave him a chance to respond because Abram has said, if they are not willing. See, so he knew uh, the consent of these people is necessary. So he didn't tell them what Rebecca said. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? About that we have plenty of room. Yeah. And he said, I being in the way, the Lord led me in the right way to take my master's brother's daughter and his son. You say, wait, wait. And they, my master's brother's daughter, it was no, his granddaughter, it wasn't his daughter. But in the Jewish way of reckoning, they would often call a relative like a brother, like Lot was called Abraham's brother. See, how could this be? They use brother like we do in Christ. Yeah. Uh -huh. See? Same way. We call each other brother. <laughs> Somebody says, well, he's not your brother. Well, he is in Christ. They were brethren in the, yeah, right. in the holy lineage, see? Uh -huh. But that's how, he could, that's how he could say that and be accurate. I'm, I'm going to close there, brother. I'm... There's a lot to cover there, and uh, I'm more and more impressed with this servant. Amen. How faith, how faithful he was, and how accurate he was, and Amen. how patient he was, and how wise he was and how long-suffering he was, and how diligent he was. See, all that you could, it's quite a picture that you see of him. It's a long journey. And he did right off the bed, he's going in there and he's telling about it, he rehearsed the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. Any of you have something you'd like to add tonight? 
Yes, Sister Meg. I appreciate the fact that this servant was so concerned with accomplishing his master's will that he wasn't even willing to feed himself. That's right. To, to, to see to his own needs Amen. until he had done his master's will. And this is a very good picture of how we are with Christ. Amen. And until, until we have... Uh, begun to do what is the will of our Father. We have no business trying to, to accomplish anything else. This is a, a priority. Yes. Very good. Okay. Yes, Sister Barbara? I made this comparison of hastening and the slowness of response. Mm -hmm. I was also continuing that comparison and a slowness of response is like a halting. Halting, I yeah. I to <laughs> use that that language, but a halting is a yielding. And when you yield, then you're holding back, and there is an entrance there for other things to enter in. So the hastening then is closing that door so that the distractions aren't as easy. Very good. Very good. It's, yeah, it's unbelief, is what it is, when you don't hasten, because the kingdom is forcefully advancing and forceful men take hold of it. Mm -hmm. And so to, to be slow apart is to be unbelieving, to not be confident in Amen. what the Lord has has given you to do. Amen. I was thinking too of this um, this the woman, how the body of Christ is the is the woman, right. and how each one of us in, as an individual is not really important. We're not named. We're the body. Yeah. So uh, that's why it's important to be part of the body and not think of yourself as an individual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I appreciated um, this aspect that you brought out about what was given. To Rebecca as the first fruits yeah. of what she would receive and if you look and see at the things that the Lord has done now for us and you almost can't even fathom what what is yet to come amen <laughs> amen yes um, when you were talking about the servant who would not eat until he had told them why he was there um, what came to my mind when you talked to this was when Jesus was at the well and he didn't eat and how he had a work to do so he didn't eat and how um, with the servant he knew that he had to work for his master and how Jesus knew that he had to work for his master as well Amen yeah. um, when, she, when she told him yeah well, there's enough we have enough she didn't have to say, well, hold on a minute. I'll go ask permission. I'll go see what my mom wants me to do. She knew exactly what they would do. And uh, that, that's quite a blessing when you see, you know, somebody ask you a question, well, what do you think? You know, if you're in Christ, you, you can give an answer. You can give a good answer because you know, you know, Paul said, I, I know him. And this is, you know, this is something, this is family talk for sure. But um, at the same time, it's good to know that you know. Amen. Yes, for the right. I thought of the fact that the servant, after he had prayed, he didn't just sit by passively waiting for, for things yeah. to kind of happen. He, he was forward to do mm -hmm. what he could perceive to be right. God's will in this whole matter. Yes. And uh, I'm reminded of the text that says, Thy people shall all be willing in the day yeah, of thy power. Amen. It's not just that the power makes them willing, although that's true. But on their part, the knowledge that God's power is devoted in a certain direction yeah, yeah. provokes them to be to be involved Amen. in the work. It's kind of like when uh, Joshua and Caleb here they are in the breadth of the land, and they sense that God's power is going to give them this land. Yeah. And you you actually go to one of these texts. If He delights in us, you know we'll take the land. That's right. And they were forward to move out. <laughs> But that, the people halted. That put a new slant on expansion, spirit expansion of the disciples, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, Judah. I too was thinking of when this this quote that you put in the lesson. Where, wherever there is slowness of heart and of response, a major work of God is needed. I've been, I've been thinking if if you don't respond to something that. A command is given, mm -hmm. or something that needs to be done. That assumes not only, not only laziness, but that you don't really want to. You don't really want to do what you heard. What you heard. There's a quote. 
he goes in here one in one ear and out the other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And slowness to response assumes that. Because if you don't heed what is the warnings in Galatians, the whole book is a warning. Yeah. If, we don't know what happened, but if the Galatians didn't heed that warning, they would have gone downhill. When we heed warnings and commands that God's given us, it will greatly benefit us oh, because amen. He rewards those who diligently seek Him. Amen. Yes, Brother Matthew. Um, I had thought about when you were talking about um, those uh, who don't uh, have an appetite for these things and they don't ever fill themselves to the point of, of, of being satisfied. I had thought about um, the time when Elisha uh, told Joash, you know, the smile on the ground. We have a whole, a whole uh, generation of people in the church who don't think to smite Christ, you know. Yeah. And, and they don't ever partake to the point to where they can culture this appetite that they need to be able to have full victory over, yeah. over the opposition. Of it. Vivid picture, isn't it? At least five or six times it should have shot. <laughs> hey, you only shot three arrows. Yeah. He was a dying man, remember? Yeah. <laughs> Elisha was <laughs> irritated him. <laughs> All right, we'll have a closing word of prayer. Our right, Heavenly Father, we pray that you give us wisdom to ingest these things that we read and be able to associate them with your great salvation and to see the various pictures and mirrors of your work that is written there. And we're very grateful that you have been zealous to show yourself to us and to do so in quite remarkable detail. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.